Is anyone okay with fun? Uh, and also to hear about climate uh, solutions from an, some extraordinary entrepreneurs that we have gathered from around the world. High level, we want to educate you about some really fascinating climate solutions. And most importantly, we want to inspire you to act. Now, acting may look like investing in some of these companies. It may look like connecting them to really interesting people. It may look like buying their products. Um, it may look like dancing on the table, but you need to act. Um, let me be clear, if anyone from the SEC is listening, that all of these entrepreneurs are, in fact, raising money today. However, you should not, under any circumstances, believe that what you are seeing is any sort of advertisement or promotion for uh, an investment product or service. Can we all agree that that's not what you're hearing? OK, thank you. Um, you will have a chance to um, meet with them afterwards. We're going to have time for networking in this room. So if you get excited by any of what you've heard, we encourage you to stick around and meet the entrepreneurs, um, or at least hang out and chat to the folks um, at your table. Uh, so how is this all going to work? Uh, we are going to start um, in a moment with an update from an entrepreneur who was here last year. Uh, so we want to hear from Ji Cheng about what's going on with his company. Then each of the entrepreneurs is going to come up, and they are going to have seven minutes uh, that I will be looking at them, timing them very deeply. Um, and then we have some amazing panelists who are going to ask questions of them and of their ideas. Um, I'll be the MC keeping things going. Uh, and hopefully this is fun, interactive, live, and all the good stuff I was talking about earlier. So speaking of panelists, we have two with us today who are going to be uh, questioning the entrepreneurs. First is Matt Hagman, who is presently the Chief Strategic Officer, uh, no, sorry, Chief Strategic Initiatives Officer. That's the CSIO, Matt. You, you might have asked for a shorter title. Um, at Right to Start, which is a nonprofit that fights to expand entrepreneurship for all, which is a great thing. Let's give it up for Right to Start. Previously, you, you may have seen him around town if you're from Miami. He was at Opportunity Miami at the Beacon Council. And uh, you know, he'd run for Congress, and he's been on the news a lot. He, he's a great party host. Um, uh, and a fun fact, just in case you didn't know, and I didn't, that Matt is fascinated by New Orleans jazz legend Professor Longhair. Any Longhair fans? Uh, Less impressively, he started a biography of him 20 years ago. <laughs> and, uh, and it's still a work in progress. So we know he's not a very fast writer. Hopefully, he can come up with questions pretty quickly. Um, Nyana Miranda is next to him. Um, you should wave. She is a principal at MSH Partners, where she invests at the intersection of climate and inclusion. She is a native Brazilian, which one means that she can dance. But it also means that she is passionate, uh, in her case, about promoting climate business and climate action in the Amazon. Um, and so she's done a lot of work there um, in many ways. Unlike uh, Matt, who uh, sometimes writes about music, uh, Nyana actually is in a band, um, a startup band, exactly. She's an entrepreneur uh, called Love Alchemy. Uh, and Matt, my suggestion to you is if it kind of doesn't work for Professor Longhair, you can write a book about Niana. Um, all right, so let's get started. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce Jaqing Za, who's already behind me. What, can he, like, put, did he have like his fingers above my head the whole time? Um, he is the founder of CoFlow Jet, which hopes to revolutionize both the jet and cargo shipping industries. So we want to know, how's it going? Thank you. Give it up. My name is Raka Chingza. I'm the CEO of uh, CoFlow Jet. Um, we have a core technology called CoFlow Jet, which is originated from aerospace research. I'm also a professor at the University of Miami. So we apply the same technology uh, to marine shipping. <clears throat> so we are very happy, just recently selected by NASA to potentially fly on Mars. Flying on Mars is not so, a little difficult because the air is very, very thin. It's only 100 of the Earth. So, it shows the potential of the technology. Um, so why do marine shipping? 
actually 90% of the global goods are transported by ships. So it's a very, very big uh, sector, very big polluter. Uh, just one largest of the ships, the annual emission is equal, equal to 50 million cars. I am certainly feel uh, sorry for uh, Elon Musk, but he's doing a good job. Um, but you know, it's going to wipe out a lot of electric cars. So all these fine lines are the uh, marine shipping lines. Um, so, and why, what's the problem with the current technology? It is, um, you know, in general, well, current technology is flattened rotor and the turbo cells and the rigid uh, cells. The uh, flattened rotor needs to spin the large cylinders and turbo cells does not need to spin but the lift coefficient is lower. The aircraft wing is even lower. So in general, they have low thrust, complex, high cost and low return of investment. Our technology is that we embed a series of fans inside the cylinder. We also use the cylinder, but we don't need to spin the cylinder. So when the air is coming from the side, we suck in air at the near uh, the four o'clock position, pressurize and eject back at the 12 o'clock position. So generate very high thrust. So we already have 17 patents issued based on 20 years of research funded by various government agencies. And <coughs> um, we did uh, all kind of wind tunnel testing so what's the progress from our last uh, Aspen Idea Climate 2023? We really appreciate uh, all the help and support from Aspen Idea Climate. So we are currently in discussion with one of the largest shipping line in the world um, as a strategic investor and the partners. Actually, we already have um, uh, eight meetings, um, including three in person. Uh, I will be there again next month. We're closing one million pre-seed fund by next month. We have a pilot program determined um, between Miami and the Bahamas, the local shipping line. Um, our technologies are ready for pilot testing and a marine shipping network is being in development uh, thanks to the uh, uh, Aspen Idea Climate um, publicity. We definitely welcome um, all the help and the collaborations. Uh, so this, uh, you can see this color <laughs> cylinders is a CFD simulation from our uh, computer simulation. So what's the future plan? We, are, we plan to finish the uh, pilot program with a real shipping line in the ocean in two years and ge start generating revenue in three years. Um, but this requires us to uh, raise seed money for $5 million and uh, Series A for $20 million. So the overall future opportunity is very big. The market is in $100 billion, uh, could be up to $1 trillion dollars um, beyond 2050. So we want to, our re revenue uh, model is licensing, manufacturing, sales, and the leasing. We want to become a billion dollar company in 10 years. So here's our team. Uh, myself is there and this, uh, Dr. Ren is a CTO. Of, um, uh, Hagen uh, is uh, our VP is sitting there and Renee is a marketing man <coughs> uh, advisor. So you can also see we have a lot of the um, uh, sponsors from the government. That's all for now. Thank you. So that's just proof it can kind of work. You know, no pressure, but all of you have to raise a million dollars by next year because of people you meet here. Okay, no pressure. A lot of pressure on you. Um, I am now very excited to introduce Sam Teicher, who is the founder of Coral Vita, whose mission is to restore and protect coral reefs all around the world. Sam, bring it on. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, thanks for doing the work you do, because we're all on Team Climate. Um, so my name is Sam Teicher. I'm the co-founder and chief reef officer of Coral Vita, and we grow corals to restore dying reefs. So for those who aren't familiar, in addition to being absolutely magical, coming as someone who's been a diver since I was a kid, uh, coral reefs are incredibly valuable. So the latest estimates are that through tourism, coastal protection, fisheries, even medicines that are already found in the market, coral reefs generate $2.7 trillion a year. They're found in over 100 countries and territories, and they sustain up to a billion livelihoods and a quarter of marine life despite taking up less than 1% of the seafloor. But as I'm sure many of you know, they are also in really bad shape. We've lost half of the world's coral reefs since the 1970s. Here in the Florida Keys, 95% of reefs are gone, and we're currently on track to lose over 90% by 2050. 
that is an ecological tragedy, but when we also think about how many livelihoods, how much value, how much biodiversity depends on coral reefs, this is a serious, serious threat. So the good news is just like we can plant trees for reforestation, we can plant corals for reef restoration. Uh, there's an amazing field of scientists, practitioners, NGOs that have been working in Florida all around the world for the past several decades, showcasing how we can bring reefs back to life. But the challenge is that unfortunately the existing model has some key limitations. Uh, for those who've ever had to apply for a UN grant before, uh, like I did when I worked at an NGO in Mauritius, it's a cumbersome process, you don't get a lot of money, the funding runs out and then the projects can die. When you set up underwater gardens, it's a really nice day at the office, uh, but there are limitations in terms of the species you can grow, resilience that can be built into the projects, and needing to get out on the water all the time. So right now we know what can work, but we also know that things need to change to really help ensure that there are reefs for future generations. And that is why we launched Coral Vita as a mission-driven for-profit where we use land-based facilities incorporating novel technologies, scientific methods, and a mission-driven commercial model in order to fund ecosystem scale impact. So there are ways that other scientists have pioneered uh, to grow corals up to 50 times faster. We're using those methods. That unlocks critical species diversity. So we can grow corals in months and years instead of decades and centuries. At the same time, by growing corals on land in tanks, we can more or less give corals the spa treatment or we can take them to the gym. So we can make it just the way they like it to grow fast or to be healthy or we can mimic future ocean temperatures as an example, raise them in our tanks, stress harden the corals so that when we outplant them, they can better survive threats. And for those who weren't paying attention last summer, massive spikes in Florida around the Caribbean killed a lot of corals due to heat and it's happening right now on the Great Barrier Reef and in other places around the world. So this is not a problem for the future, it's something that's happening right in front of our eyes. So all of this lets us grow more diverse, resilient, and ultimately affordable corals. And so you can see on the left, actually, these little micro fragments of corals, they're starting to fuse into their neighbors. Uh, and so some of these species, again, could take decades or centuries to reach the size of a plate we can now grow significantly faster. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we have a community-based approach to our model, it's very core for who we are and how we operate. Um, our first farm is in Freeport, Grand Bahama. It's a 30 minute flight away, everyone's welcome to come check it out. Um, but making sure that through workforce development, through education, through partnerships, um, that capacity is built in wherever we're going. And uh, we've helped rehabilitate sea turtles, we support a mangrove restoration project, so really ensuring that there's this opportunity to, to do holistic work across the board. Um, I've also lived through uh, really are some of the worst of the climate crisis and have seen not only what many communities face but also how ecosystems like mangroves and coral reefs protect us. Uh, Hurricane Dorian hit Grand Bahama a few years ago. I won't go into too much detail about it, but we saw mangrove forests save lives. We saw coral reefs protect property. Uh, and that's why this work, among many, many reasons, matters so much. Uh, so what we're doing that's also different is taking a business approach to this. So looking back to the tourism, coastal protection, fisheries, benefits of reefs, thinking about how we can unlock sustainable financing to support ecosystem restoration to really keep reefs alive for the future. So we set up farms on land uh, where we sell restoration as a service to hotels, developers, insurers, while also tapping into new conservation financing mechanisms. There are coral restoration insurance policies, blue bonds, foreign debt being forgiven for that money being spent on conservation projects. So tapping into all of that to fund projects while our farms then act as revenue generating tourism attractions uh, and then running adopt a coral campaigns. Um, people from around the world, individuals or brands can actually pay for restoration. And shout out right now just to the Brazilian in the room um, because these shoes are by a Brazilian shoe company called Cariuma and so for every pair sold money from the ocean sneakers, money goes towards planting corals. We're restoring a Corona beer reef. So thinking about all these also as ways to raise awareness um, to protect reefs in the first place. At the same time, we're also developing technologies, uh, licensing them out um, that we can use internally, but also can fund restoration work around the world. Uh, and so having all of that be a driver, again, to fund larger impact. And we've already signed multi-million dollar contracts in Saudi Arabia with their leading university. They're building the biggest coral farm in the world out there. Launched a pilot facility in Dubai, government of the Bahamas, Grand Bahama Port Authority. Uh, a, a number of other entities are paying for restoration already. And through our work at Impact so far, we were also the inaugural winner of Prince William's Revive Our Oceans Earthshot Prize. 
Um, this contract in Saudi Arabia, just to, to note, when we started this, there wasn't really a market for restoration. Um, now, the biggest farm in the world, like I said, is being built out there. Um, they're putting hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars into things like coral restoration. Uh, and being able to run that facility on their behalf, growing corals, is a huge step forward, not just for Coral Vita, but the entire global space. Um, seeing how more and more people are actually starting to spend money in all of this. And looking at that market, just in the past few years, looking forward to 2030, from the US, Saudi, and Australian governments alone, there's been commitments of $6 billion. There's now a $500 million global fund for coral reefs. I mentioned coral restoration insurance policies. DARPA was on the screen before. They have a program uh, that's actually being piloted here with the University of Miami called Refence, looking at how oyster and coral restoration can protect naval bases better than traditional seawalls. So having this all come together is really exciting, and we're now starting to expand, looking at places like Florida uh, and elsewhere around the world to launch farms. We envision a global network of large-scale coral farms in every nation with reefs around the world to keep them alive for the future, and have really been getting a lot of great recognition for this work hopefully also highlighting not just our work, but the other amazing coral restoration practitioners who've been doing this for years. Um, we've got an amazing team. I don't need to go through all of our bios, but PhD scientists, former Fortune 500 executives. Um, my co-founder and I started this with a $1,000 grant while we were in grad school, and now I'm standing here 10 years later talking to all of y'all um, and seeing a really tremendous amount of progress happening um, for the company and in this space as a whole. And, Coming towards the end, we're getting ready right now to launch our $15 million Series A. Uh, we've raised pre-seed and seed rounds thus far. Uh, we're generating revenue, and we're looking, as I said, to launch farms around the world. Definitely would love to connect with people uh, in the South Florida space. This is a place we're looking to operate in, digging deeper into our R&D and advancing the technologies that we and other practitioners can use, um, and really taking this forward so that we can help keep reefs alive for the future. So everyone's invited to come plant corals with us in the Bahamas. Um, and looking forward to talking to you, and thanks for your time, and hope everyone has a great rest of their festival. I'm the first one, I forgot. I didn't watch the <laughs> well, well, you get one bonus point for the Brazilian shoes. <laughs> Just one, though. So, um, quick question on the um, potential risks that you face. So, how have you tested, so how have you tested the work that you've done in terms of long-term risk that you face with the product? Yeah, it's a great question. So we never guarantee that all our corals are going to make it because there's no way to actually do that. Um, so we mitigate certain risks. We always make sure it's a site that's viable for restoration. Had a hotel once that said, this is a no-brainer. We want to bring in snorkel and scuba tourists. Next to their beach was a river, and upstream was a textile factory. There's nothing we can do in those types of circumstances, but then also measuring baselines, because um, it's also not just a matter of plant patting ourselves on the back. We planted. 10,000 corals, what does that actually mean? So one of our restoration sites, we've seen a two-fold increase in fish populations. Um, we had, before the bleaching this past summer, at that site, 75% coral survivorship. Uh, another one had 99%, another one had 30%. And for perspective, in the Bahamas, the Caribbean, after one year, if you've got 30 to 50% survivorship, that's considered really good. After the bleaching, um, again, water temperatures got to 97 degrees. Uh, there was one area where very sadly, 100% of the natural reef died, and 30% of our corals were still surviving. So I want that number closer to 80 or 90%, but seeing just in a short amount of growth, corals we grew making it um, with the challenge we're facing is very encouraging. And again, this is a global field of science known as assisted evolution, so we're not, only, we're not the only people who are trialing out these methods for resilience, but starting to see, I, I, again, I wish my job didn't exist, um, we shouldn't, frankly, have to exist, but taking these steps forward to ensure that corals will survive for the future are seeing really meaningful amounts of progress on that front. Okay. Sam, great presentation. Really enjoyed it and super inspiring. Thank you. Talk a little bit more about your revenue mix. I mean, what that looks like now. You talked about the different revenue streams, um, but, you know, at scale, what does this look like? Yeah, so we'll really be focusing on selling restoration as a service, layered with the potential of those conservation financing mechanisms, and then licensing tech. So it's a multi-million dollar contract for a few years in uh, Saudi Arabia with the university out there. Uh, if they get to phase two, or sorry, say when they get to phase two, that could expand significantly. So the farm they currently have is about 30 tanks, and each tank is about the size of the table in front of you right here. Um, the current 
facility we have in the Bahamas is about 30, so it's similar like for like. They plan on having 400 tanks in the second phase. So if we are lucky enough to win that contract, that would be a, a healthy revenue stream. Uh, with the uh, funding model in, say, the Bahamas, the vertically integrated one, so as an example, we are one of the first entities getting funded by the Global Fund for Coral Reefs. It's this multilateral $500 million instrument. Uh, we're part of a nationwide project with other partners. We're getting um, $600,000, $625,000 for a restoration project. The plan is for that then to get matched by a forthcoming resort. And if it stops there, it's great. It's a seven-figure restoration contract, really make meaningful impact in the reefs and for the communities. But then they're also looking at, could a coral restoration insurance policy be layered on top of that? If the Bahamas was a country that, say, had a blue bond or a debt for nature swap, or, and they're still a few years away, but if biodiversity offsets were coming, that one catalytic piece of capital from GFCR could become an eight-figure restoration contract, all while then the farms themselves are generating revenue, being tourism attractions, people paying entrance fees, running those adopt a coral and sponsorship programs. So having that sort of stack really gives us a, a healthy pathway for growth and for revenue. And so, so you're in the Bahamas right now. In terms of when you're looking to scale, and you mentioned Florida and, and, and other places, what are some of the, the regulatory challenges that, that you'll see? Every coral country has permits for them. So that's always something we've got to navigate, um, depending on which country, then, you know, ease of doing business and, and the business physical side of the regulatory environment. One of the reasons why we initially chose the Bahamas was because we had a local partner, the Grand Bahama Port Authority, that gave us land for $10 a year, made introductions to the Bahamian government, and we got permits in a fairly streamlined fashion, connections to local community members. And so, again, we want to have eventually farms in every country, but we were being judicious now from a market, uh, ecological, and then a partnership level. How do we navigate that? And so looking at places like Florida, we've been establishing relationships not only with other members of the coral restoration community and people in sort of the development space, but state government, county governments, federal government, uh, and making sure that we are aware of what we have to um, go through to make that thing happen. In a past life, I also worked for a coalition of island nation governments, and so we're also fairly plugged in to the sort of small island developing state network, and navigating through island time a little bit faster than might be typically the case is definitely something that helps us, again, know what we have to do ahead of time. Awesome. That's it. Sam. All right, thank, thank you. you very much. That Thanks was awesome. Everybody. Thank you. Before it goes away, take a picture, get in touch with Sam, meet him afterwards. Um, I, will, I will interject with a sad note that unfortunately Ranjit from Mortar.io is not able to join us today because he had a family health emergency back in the United Kingdom. Um, but we're hoping to get him back next year. Um, and instead, we're going to keep moving on with the show with Jonna Porter from Fractal. She is the founder and CEO, and she hails from the great state of Texas, which, which might be my <clears throat> home state as well. Um, she makes bio-based materials from leftovers and is going to radically alter what your house looks like. Jonna. Hi, I'm Jonna. I just want to clarify, I'm from Houston. I'm not from any other part of Texas. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, my name is Jonna Porter. I am the founder and CEO of Fractal. We are an early stage company, materials company based in Houston that is developing polymers made from plant materials, specifically materials that are traditionally thrown away, whether they are landfilled or thrown into wastewater streams. Um, we are looking to revolutionize or speed the transition away from polyvinyl chloride. I'm sure you guys are familiar with PVC and all the, the problems with PVC. Um, East Palestine, Ohio should come to mind um, and how that impacts com uh, excuse me, communities, especially those that are vulnerable. So you may not be familiar, but 70% of the PVC, which is 40 million tons a year, is for your house. So that is roofing materials, that's cables, that's cabinets, fencing, flooring, not just the conduits for your plumbing. Um, and it impacts everything in the building material space. 
PVC is made from some of the worst materials on the planet, including vinyl chloride monomer, which is what spilled in East Palestine, Ohio. Um, it has a complex supply chain. If you're not aware, it's also um, traditionally made in the Uyghur region in China, and the United States has already set up, um, and, and it's under slave labor. And so the United States has already set up the UFLPA, which has those items on the border because they are not allowed to come in the country because they're made from slave labor. So think about that when you are redoing your luxury vinyl tile on your flooring or you're putting up new fencing that potentially somebody was um, made that under duress, right? So it's also toxic. Uh, it degrades into microplastics. I'm sure you've heard a lot about microplastics today. It releases dioxin dioxins and phthalates. It disrupts your endocrine system. There are just so many things wrong with it. I just could talk about that all day. Um, it also contains titanium dioxide. Who's heard of titanium dioxide? Yeah, it's in your Skittles. It shouldn't be there either. It is one of the, the worst things. It's used to, um, as it's, because it's so white, it's used to color things, right? And it's probably in your toothpaste, all those things. But when you go home, look at it. It's just, it, it shouldn't be there. Um, so the problem really is there are a lack of healthy building materials. Um, in the, especially in the United States. And what happens is vulnerable communities um, typically are subject to low cost alternatives that cannot be repaired. So they stay and they off gas and they remain in a state of disrepair for years and years and years. And if you're not aware, in the United States, we spend over 90% of our time indoors. So now you're breathing this stuff all day long for the next 10 to 15 years. Um, it's not fun. So here is a picture of our proof of concept um, that we developed after talking to a lot of customer discovery with flooring material companies. I mentioned luxury vinyl tile, um, but this could be a carpet backing, something of that nature. Um, all of those layers are polyvinyl chloride. And so this is something we did just um, at the Mississippi Polymer Institute just to show that it works. If you're familiar with uh, performance testing, those are tensile strength dog bones. Um, and we were able to prove that it worked and that it was comparable to the polyvinyl chloride that is currently in the market. So uh, what do you really want to know? The market size. This is huge. Like I mentioned, 40 billion tons a year globally. Um, that's pellets, PVC pellets. Um, the market for building and construction is the majority, 60 to 70 percent. Like I mentioned, what we made, roughly 20 to 30 percent films and sheets. So that's $2.8 billion just in the US just for a sheeting product annually with an increase of about 6 to 7% a year. Um, and that's bottom down or top up, um, if you're familiar with those. So our model is, I think, interesting for an early stage company. As I mentioned, we divert these materials. The plant materials that we um, put into our product as a raw material, we receive from companies typically throwing them away in landfills or putting it into wastewater. So we keep them from doing that. And then we provide them that dashboard data to say, OK, you were going to throw away 20 tons of this plant material, but we took it away. This is the equivalent in GHG emissions. So those things can go in their ESG data and the reporting. And then we get paid to take something away. So we get paid on this side. And then we also get paid on that side, which is a really cool uh, business model. Um, and then we have a manufacturing process with a patent pending um, that we started about a year and a half ago. We worked at the University of Illinois, the Bioprocessing Research Laboratory, if you know, is one of the best in the world. And there's another picture of my hand with our POC, um, just a sheeting product that we make. But it can also be made in a lot of different media forms, um, pellets, casting, films, anything that you can think of with a polymer-based product. Um, so RIP. Although we started with an initial plant stream, we have already identified other plant streams that act in the same way. So this year is really our IP year. So we have an IP, uh, excuse me, a patent that we submitted a couple months ago. And then this year we have six in the pike for other plant streams. Um, and they're high lignin content streams, if you guys are familiar with lignin and, and plant and what that does. Um, and it's a scalable manufacturing process, so it can be tacked onto something to easily make sort of a, a craft size batch or, or larger. Um, our business model is really based 
to work with companies as a licensing to say, okay, here is something that we've built out from beginning to end based on the um, capacity that you would like. And it's a bio box, excuse me, bio-based epoxy resin composite is the actual name of what we're building. So what is the difference? Um, it's 100% natural. You could probably eat it. It would taste bad, and it would probably rip your teeth out, but you could eat it. Um, we have a localized manufacturing network, and we chose those places um, very carefully. Obviously, Texas, because I'm in Texas, um, and also because it is the energy capital of the world. So all of the chemicals and fossil fuels, that's where it is. It's in Houston, so that's where we are. We're in Greentown Labs. If any of you guys are familiar with Greentown Labs, that's where we are. Um, Chicago, Illinois, um, we have supply chains, manufacturing networks. We also did a lot of our, oh, 20 seconds. We did a lot of our, our build up work uh, at the University of Illinois in Georgia because of the logistics from the um, south and east coast. Really quickly, this is what we did in 2023. Um, I was an Impel innovator, which is the Department of Energy with the Building Technologies Office. They thought what we did was cool, and I'm over time. Jonna, that was great. Thanks. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, uh, and by the way, here uh, in uh, Miami, we often say we're in Miami, not Florida. So I hear you <laughs> when you said Thank you. you're in Houston, not Texas. <laughs> yes. um, uh, talk, uh, talk about cost. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, to get widespread adoption, ultimately need to shrink the, the green premium, hopefully, to, yes. to zero. Mm. And ultimately, you know, as we think about the transition, the products that we're delivering have to be, you know, cooler, faster, better. Yes. Um, and not dramatically more expensive. How do you measure up right now, and what's the thinking going forward? Yeah, so full transparency, PVC is cheap, right? You guys have gone to Home Depot, Lowe's, when, and, you know, you can buy a truckload for $5. We're not there yet. So we are at TRL5, if you're familiar with that. So right now, because we've shown that it can work in a lab scale and we've done work on industrial size equipment, now is really the commercialization stages to see what is it going to take. Um, one of those things is the reduction of emissions. So we're working with someone to, to show that it's a 70% reduction based to um, traditional PVC, and then also to show that we can get the cost where it needs to be. Some of that may mean using decommissioned facilities or, or like paper and pulp facilities that are going out of business and things like that, um, but it's, it's part of a plan. We get asked that question all the time, right? Um, it's just gonna take time. Awesome, thank you, and great presentation as well. Thanks. And I also lived in Houston, so <laughs> go H-Town. <laughs> yes. And um, so piggybacking off of what Matt said, in terms of, have you done a life cycle analysis oh. in terms of the long-term effects of your product and also as it relates to the durability compared to the other product? Yeah, very good question. So there are, short answer, the TEA and the LCA are in progress. Um, the, the durability, there's a lot of different tests that we have determine we need to do and including not just durability but also um, biodegradability. Is that important for something that we're doing? Especially with the way that building materials work, um, it's one of the largest contributors to landfill waste, right? Can we put this back in the process? Can we make it into something else? Um, but it's, it's in progress, yeah. Do we have time for one more question? Oh, we do, yeah, <laughs> awesome. The, uh, um, you know, this is a space with lots of uh, um, uh, established, uh, well-capitalized companies. Mm. Frankly. So how do you think, who, I mean, I guess thinking that, you know, if they chose to go this route, they could pour lots of money towards trying to, uh, to build a, a similar product. And, yeah. um, how are you thinking about differentiating from them? Is this something really built on moving really fast or, yeah. you know, how, how to separate yourself? Yeah, I don't think we need to separate ourselves. Um, we've talked to those companies. Actually, they've come to us. Mm. So that's sort of, you know, yeah. right? Um, but I think part of it is I don't think they, a lot of them, thought that this would happen as soon as it has. Um, this really strong desire, organic desire for alternatives to what is out there. And so a lot of the supply chains and 
are very focused on fossil fuel based materials. And even though they may have something um, technically in some stage of R&D that works, they have not built those things out fully. Um, that's really what we spent. So our companies be four years in July. That is what we spent a lot of upfront doing. Does it make sense from a logistics standpoint? Can we do this in the US? Do, can we not have to send things across seas to do R&D or get materials? And so that's where we placed a lot of effort. And so um, what I think will happen with our company is that we will probably end up working with one of the larger companies to say, these are the, the, the lanes that we've already built out. These are the lanes that you've already built out. If we work together, we could probably do this sooner and it would be better for everybody involved. And, and perhaps if you want to just mention a little bit about the roadmap as well that you have since you didn't have a chance to finish that up. Yeah, no worries. Um, so it's going to be a busy year. Last year was a busy year. We got our first funding at the beginning of last year um, through an accelerator, moved into Greentown Labs, if you're familiar again. It's an incubator. It's the largest climate tech incubator in the United States. Um, submitted some patents. Um, this year we'll do some more. I mentioned that. And then we'll extend the testing. So uh, the initial testing was um, for like tinsel strength water, all the sort of the basic, these will be more like the durability tests that she brought up, um, process optimization, things like that, so we can speak to life cycle analysis and techno-economic analysis when we go in front of people to, to compare them to the PVC that's in the market now. Um, and then next year will be all about the biomass expansion. Although we have one now, are there other sources of biomass that we can use that is typically underutilized um, to build things? Thank you. Thank you. Give it up one more time for Jana. So have you ever wondered what happens to your cable box when you cut the cord or you get an upgrade? I used to wonder about that, actually. I really wanted to make sure it got recycled. And it turns out that many of those boxes end up in the hands of Gloria Martinez and Mersen Vasquez, who are the two leaders of NEO Holdings. They are working at the forefront of electronics repair and recycling. And oh, by the way, they're married. That must be fun. Bring it on, y'all. <laughs> Hello, good morning. You must be wondering how I'm doing, what we're gonna talk about. And after hearing everybody speaking, like it's, it's amazing. But before I start, or we start, I have to tell you a little bit of our story. 12 years ago, sitting down in our home here in Miami, we just decided to be an entrepreneur. We faced many of the challenges that come with a decision. For me, just imagine, husband and wife, out of job, self-funding, with a two and a three-year-old, Latinos in the telecommunication industry. Quite a challenge. But we have a clear vision to be the most trusted solutions provider in the Americas, maintaining integrity between people and planet. With this idea in our heart, we have created the popular concept we hear today, our own circular economy. We are Neo Holding Group, a group of companies in the telecommunication industry dedicated just to give solutions to our customer. So we started with the sales of the product with Neo Broadband, new and used to keep everyone connected. But over there, this is our backbone, first company, main company. Over there, we saw that we were not impacting the planet as much as we wanted to. And then we gave birth to Green Telecom. So let's refurbish those products. Let's the, extend the life of the product. But we were so meticulous, and we just wanna just no partial impact, full impact, because we figured out that we created our own e-waste. And we start tracking down where those e-waste are going how they were handled. We didn't like what we saw. 
And when we came out with TriCycle, we recycle, not just recycle, properly recycle for the betterment of the planet. Do you know that United States, all the electronic e-waste end up 80% in the landfill? How much do you think is that equivalent to? Let's take a guess. One, two, three. Every second that I just count is equivalent to 1,000 laptops thrown away. We just threw away 3,000 laptops in a matter of seconds. So just not products as well, money. We generate disease. And we're reducing our green life. The United Nations estimate that 40% of the electronic e-waste of the United States end up in developing countries. And that's what we focus first. Here, in our locations, we have locations in Miami, Costa Rica, Panama, Paraguay, and Chile. We went from six employees up to hundreds of employees. And we were able, just last year data, to reduce almost 35 million pounds together. Thank you, thank you. And let's come back home now, the United States, where we have the title of the second largest producer, where 5.5 million tons end up in the landfill every year. I'm gonna repeat that number again, 5.5 million tons. And we are here in the summer because we understand all the issues it causes for the environment, right? However, do you know what it costs to your human body, right? Here are some of the side effects, heart, brain, kidney issues, lung cancer, and many, many others, right? And as population grows, we are moving closer to those landfill. A good example of that is here in South Florida. Now, let's look at the market segmentation. Who are the biggest producers? Here, we can see the private businesses are leading this data with 69.5, right? And we dig deeper in telecommunication, even though we are doing those numbers that Gloria mentioned, it's only been recycled 9.9%. Now, population is growing, as we all know that, right? And look at the chart. As more population we have, more electronic waste will be produced. Data moves really, really fast. We want to be connected everywhere we go. Equipment, electronic equipment, is becoming disposable, right? Or it means that we have a long, long way to go. Now, Gloria mentioned why we're here today. We are here to partner with you guys in the room, right? Where together we can responsibly recycle electronic e-waste. Now, let's look at the, these numbers. Just imagine if we can recycle 35,000 tons. We can create more jobs and more important or initially we plant 17,500 trees. With the name called Less Electronic Recycle, More Tree. Now, most of this data is done in telecommunication. What are other businesses doing? Manufacturing, retail, hospitality, and many, many other industries. We have a proven concept that works, right? It has been working for many, many years, and we can duplicate what we are doing in telecommunication and any other industry. And the idea is to do it together. Together, we can become a better planet, we can have better community, and better health. Thank you. Thank you. And, and first off, very inspiring as a Latina immigrant as well who's had families build businesses out of necessity. Um, I, I love hearing those types of stories. And can you talk a little bit more around the business model? So I understand that you've now recycled 35 million pounds of of this, and can you can you talk about how the business model works? Go ahead. Yes, definitely. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, the business model is to go to telecommunication company, all the type of industry, and not only selling the products, right? So what we have seen is that as technology change, like I mentioned before, right, or something get damaged, right, they have to receive that product. 
And the business for them is to save CapEx, right? Because by, by us refurbishing their product inside, they don't have to handle with logistics, right? They don't have to go to supply chain, right? We handle all of that. And when that product doesn't work, we let them know, listen, don't worry about it, we're gonna handle that. And we are able to give uh, all the reports, you know, at the end of the year, and work together with them and their, their team, right? The company also uh, educated them, right? Because it's one thing that we do with the company as you look, look in the data. But what about if we educate it and the employees there, the family? We will not be able to recycle more. There we go. So I really enjoyed it and super inspiring. Um, I guess just to follow up on that, just to give a little bit more color to sort of this, this whole process. Um, so for example, maybe do a, 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 for instance, like with a laptop and in recycling a laptop, where does it go? Yeah. Um, you know, when it's in your hands, how is that recycled? Um, and then how are you making money through that process? Yeah, that's a great question. That's the same reason we're starting the business, right? Mm -hmm. We used to refurbish a lot of equipment and we used to produce a lot of e-waste because almost 70% uh, is good, 30% doesn't work, where does it go, right? What we have done since we were created, right? We have been able to develop those partners, right? We've been able to partner with refineries, right? <laughs> Those refineries create pressure metal, like you have your cell phone there. Randa is texting right now in a cell phone, right? Those are created with precious metals, right? You have gold, silver, a lot of precious metal there. So what we did, we partnered with refineries where they receive those products, right? And they create new products. For them, it's cheaper, right? Get it from your cell phone, they go to mining. So do you, just to follow up on that, do you disassemble uh, and then you're then sending the respective parts and, uh, and to uh, different, as you called it, refineries. That's correct. Um, and you're able to get to 100% recycling, like there's a home for each component of a laptop, for example? We would love to, right? There's some idle that's pretty hard to get 100%, but we're working on that. Especially in Paraguay, we have partnered with a university and an institution where they are making bridge, right? So some of those products. So um, uh, to be able to do that in all of the items, we need to work more closely with the government or regulation, because at the end of the day, nobody want to pay for that, right? You are a business, right? You tell them, pay me for that product, and they don't have any regulation, what are they going to do, mm -hmm. right? So um, um, what we tell our clients, listen, these are the group products that we can pay you for, right? Based on that, we can take care of these products, and we kind of work with them. It has taken us many, many, many years, right? But uh, uh, especially big institution, they are looking into that, and we're working with the sustainability department, right? to make that possible. Because you have different people, different department, and everybody want to chime. So that's how we're doing with that. OK. And along, along with the, the tons that you've removed, what are some milestones that you've reached at this point in terms yes. of traction? Um, we are self-funding, right? All the locations that you see there, self-funding. We feel that we have a model that works. We know the issues they have that model specific location. We don't want to have location everywhere, right? Logistic is, is, is a nightmare, right? However, we understand that model it works. We have a team that's able to handle that, right? Our model right now is how we duplicate that a little bit faster and go to other industry, right? Um, but logistic is, is one of the issues that, that we have. Um, also this year, we just uh, won a contract where we have to open operation in Puerto Rico and Trinidad and Tobago, right? We have an operation that, um, tens of the locations that we have, they're already in those locations, right? So that's, as soon as we are multinational client, we go to those countries and we can target other markets. We can target other customers because we're already there for them. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you so much. All right, next up. If you uh, look at Blaine's background, you'll see that it seems like he's truly dedicated to hanging out on really nice beaches. <laughs> but to do that, you have to figure out how to stop coastal erosion. And so that is why he has started Shorelock. Give it up. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Blaine Ross. I am chief beach officer for Shorelock. And it is fantastic to be able to come up here a little bit after Sam at Coral Vita because while Sam is the front line of what's happening with coastal erosion, we are actually the second line for what's happening with coastal erosion. 
And what's really interesting inside of this space is that many of you may not realize it, but we're about ready to revolutionize an entire industry because what I'm going to introduce to you today is a new technology that is actually protecting the second most valuable asset in the United States, sand, and actually globally for that matter. I'm going to grab the clicker. Hang on one second. So our mission is really to take, create a 100% safe ecological solution that's able to protect our coastlines. Now, whether it be beaches, microchips, toothpaste, you name it, sand is in absolutely everything that we're using across the planet right now. So much to the point that we are now using sand at a rate of three times what we were just 20 years ago. And the problem with this is that our sand supply is not only in use and out in the world, it's not staying put. Whether it's wind or water erosion, we're using it faster and faster. And you guys here in Florida and up along the coastline have probably heard this statement before. Our beach was designed to last for 10 years. It's lasted for three. When we get into agriculture, we often hear about our labor expenses are going through the roof. Everything that we're doing is, is eroding on a regular basis. We get into the golf industry. Coastal situations there are blowing the sand out of the bunkers and it's constantly having to be replenished. And here again in Florida, over the course of 1989 to two, 2022, we are now have gone to 65% of the state is considered critically eroding. So what's going on? Well, climate change is actually happening at a faster rate than we can even plan for. The Army Corps of Engineers, our politicians are doing the best that they can to try and gain taxpayer money to plan for an event and have it last for a duration. But the problem is you've got something that happens like Miami Beach where they used years to be able to come up of planning to be able to do a 2018 nourishment, spending $11 million to protect only one mile. Eight months later, 80% washed out. They had to then replace that with $16 million just to cover that same mile. You can understand that the economics that we're working with here are just not gonna work when you've got that many miles on a, a state that have to be protected. We're protecting trillions of dollars of assets. These are your homes, these are our businesses, these are our municipalities. There is a massive problem that is, we're being faced with right now and the current reactive methodologies that we're using are just not enough. We have to start changing and looking at this from a proactive standpoint. How do we capture our resource? How do we maintain it and protect it moving into the future? So we start looking at what the overall addressable size is for sand. It's massive. This right here, this 15 million, or 15 billion, excuse me, that's only here in the US. So we're gonna try and shrink this down a little bit. For just our purposes, what we're gonna talk about today is what's going on with United States municipal governments, Caribbean beachfronts and a little bit of the sports industry at about 1.34 billion in a service addressable market. Much easier for us to take a look at. So what's going on with our solution? Well, we are a powder-based compound that is 50% repurposed sargassum. So we're doing two things. One, we're protecting your coastline, and two, we're now dealing with a sargassum problem that is massive across the US. We're really excited to be working with uh, a new company that's also here uh, coming out of the Caribbean. This can be our partner that we're sourcing our biopolymers from. We're 100% plant-based, we're free of heavy metals and toxins, and we're safe to use in any environment. Now that's a big word, safe. Where does that come from? Who's been looking at it? The United Nations Environmental Protection Fund did a study for about a year, a couple back. They have looked at absolutely everything along with the University of West Indies to be able to give us the confidence to say we're safe application, we're non-toxic, there's no antibiotics in what we do, we're safe for humans, safe for turtles, safe for birds, and safe for marine life. So if we didn't cover that, we're totally safe. <laughs> I'm going to give you a quick little one, uh, one minute. Shorelock reduces beach erosion escarpments by improving sands cohesion and strength properties. With Shorelock, your beach benefits from increased stabilization, rapid dewatering, and a higher potential for natural sand accretion. Simply insert the powder compound quarterly below the surface of the sand at the mean high water line in three foot intervals. Upon contact with seawater, the ocean waves spread this environmentally safe compound across the intertidal zone 
Researchers at the Particle Engineering and Research Center at the University of Florida tested Shorelock to investigate its properties and gain greater insight into the mechanisms of how it works. Perk concluded a measurable difference in surface properties between Shorelock treated sand versus untreated sand. Under conditions of high moisture content, results show that sand treated with Shorelock exhibits significantly higher unconfined yield strength and cohesion values. The researchers also noted that the texture of Shorelock treated sand is indistinguishable from untreated sand. Shorelock is non-toxic to marine life, improves habitat for nesting turtles, contains absolutely no antibiotics or cytotoxins, and is safe for humans to use in coastal environments. So what does this look like in actuality? And you can see here on the left, this is a treated beach before and a little bit after. And what's actually going on here and what we're actually doing is we're helping to dewater a beach. We're allowing the ocean to do the work. When it comes in, it brings in sand with it. And instead of taking the sand out, we actively drain the water back into the ocean quickly. Both of these things, at the end of the day, we're keeping sand in its place. It's plain and simple. So we like to look at what's normally a competition slide as really what's, what we consider just companies in the sand pit. Nobody in here we feel like is really competition. It's really us all working together. While we stand in a class of our own and we're the only ones that do what we do, we are actually able to be used with anything that's going on out there, whether it be working with the coastal engineering divisions on sand dredging, sand mining, working with the logs. Um, we are a partner in this industry. Our moat is really understanding that we're an exclusive formula. Um, as a service, we biodegrade every six months. So once you come on from a business model standpoint, it's amazing because we're annualized like that. But because we don't want to ever put anything in the environment that stays in the environment, we are designed to biodegrade every six months. When you do stop working with it, it the beach will return back to its natural state within a, a matter of 30 to 45 days. You can see here, we've got a nice projection over the next couple of years. Again, this was just us focusing on the United States and uh, different parts of the Caribbean. I'm joined today by uh, Dr. Troy Scott. He's the inventor of the uh, solution, and he's be hanging out with me in the back. And hey, Troy. <laughs> um, and you can see some of our partners that we've already started working with down here at the bottom. Um, whether it has been working with the government or in the private sector, we've had success stories. We've been really excited about where this has been going, and we're excited to speak with you this afternoon and further the conversation. So we look forward to you helping us and seeing where we can take things. Please feel free to come see me afterwards. Well, thank you. Well, first off, um, it's, it's great to get a little bit more. I know Blaine for a little while now, and I've always got little sound bites of Shorelock, but okay. great to, to hear more about how you're bringing sand to the beach. And um, question around the lifespan of your product, and you mentioned it's differentiated from the other players, but can you talk a little bit about how? Sure. So Shorelock's really the only proactive solution that's out there. Everything that's in the industry right now is reactive. So when we have a storm that comes in, it removes the sand, we cry, we, go, we look for our uh, taxpayer dollars, we put it back, and we replace it. Shorelock is designed to be put and installed on a quarterly basis in a proactive response so that when a storm comes in, we're mitigating and adapting to what's going on with current storm damage. It gives us the ability to project and extend the life of what we're already doing, and it's not an either or, it's a, it's a yes and. Okay, thanks. Um, Blaine, terrific, I hey, really Matt. enjoyed that. Hey, the um, uh, one, just give some color on where Shorelock has been implemented, what beaches uh, have this um, uh, right now, uh, and talk about your customers. I mean, is this you're going to local governments or resort owners? I mean, what, is, what does that look like? Sure. All the pilots have been conducted throughout the Caribbean. Uh, we have worked in uh, and been cleared in Jama uh, Jamaica, the Bahamas. Uh, we've done work in Aruba um, and Dominican Republic. Uh, we'd like to get into the United States now. That's going to be our next possibility. Uh, we're looking for uh, currently a state that wants to come on and pilot with us uh, to take this to the next, uh, the next step. By the way, that raises um, a question about, I well, also want to talk about customers, but while you're sure. answering that, oh, yeah. um, just regulatory hurdles. Are there places that says we don't want this? 
uh, put in our beaches? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so the state of Florida is a really great example, and the way that uh, it has worked here is we've already been pre-cleared by the DEP and Fish and Wildlife. It's now just about identifying a municipality that wants to come on board um, to work with us, and that's actually typical of the way it'll be around the U.S. Um, the reason the pilots were all done throughout the Caribbean is we went direct to hotels, and although they're being reviewed and um, approved by the, uh, the country governments, it gives us the ability to do a direct sale stri straight to the uh, hotel owner, and it's a, a very fast process. When we move into a state, we have to be cleared per state and per DEP and per, per Fish and Wildlife. And can you mention some case studies around what the hotels are, are saying or what they're seeing? Yeah. Um, so both of the ones that you saw there are really fantastic uh, properties. There was one that was uh, done in the, bah in the Bahamas. Um, they were a, a consistently and critically eroded beach. We were able to put Shorelock on that coastline um, over the course of six months. They were actually in a great position in that they accreted sand, meaning they gained sand by about nine inches in elevation and about 15 feet in depth over the course of six months. Um, now that's in the Bahamas and it's a lower wave action, so accretion was a fantastic result for them. Um, it, Florida may be a little bit higher wave action, so we may be looking at just mitigation and adaptation responses. Um, Jamaica has had similar uh, situations. The first slide that we looked at was similar to that as well. Um, they put on, I believe it was around 12 to 13 feet in overall depth and around six to seven feet in elevational change. Okay. and, and um I'm not in that space particularly. So how, in terms of at the rate with climate change, how does Shorelock ensure that the work that you're doing is um, going to be at the rate that's needed? Yeah. So e each coastal environment is going to be a little bit different. And so what the, what the rate at which the, the ocean is doing has, is taking away sand is going to vary per location. Um, if, we, if we see in, this, in the small island nations that Shorelock is actually causing accretion to happen, what that potentially means for them as well as you know, some of the small ones that are in the South Pacific is we may be able to really, really make a difference and slow um, and give them more time to actually stay in their communities. Um, here, where the wave action is higher on the East Coast, uh, as, I, as the first slide was talking about, you know, we've got trillions of dollars of assets that are being uh, there along our U.S. coastlines. And so as we're able to just slow the rate at which things are changing, it gives us a little bit longer to avoid having to do some of the crazy ideas the Army Corps has, like, let's put up a giant wall around all of Miami. Like, you know, we, we right. can, it, it can extend our timeline. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs>Good morning, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I'm Luis Paul, um, co-founder and managing director of OBE Power, uh, a company is dedicated to the development of a smart and distributed EV charging network in the U.S. Back in 2016, uh, we started looking at the potential of EV adoption, and we realized that by 2040, between 70% and 90% of vehicle sales could be electric. That would represent 12 million new EVs sold in the US alone. But also we realized that a very strong charging infrastructure was needed, opening the door for a potential market of $107 billion by 2040. The data also suggested that most of these charging infrastructure will be deployed in locations where people live, work, and play. And we're talking about over 90%. So realizing the need of that infrastructure in those locations, and also worry that the lack of it could delay EV adoption with the consequences on the energy transition, we put forward a plan 
a, a solution called EV charging as a service at that time, a pioneer uh, uh, concept that w allows us to engage and partner with locations. Um, so without, their, without them taking the risk, nor the investment, nor the cost, instead we will take the risk, the investment, and the cost, um, and, and manage the facility for them. Um, and also providing them with a financial incentive based on carbon credit generated in the, those locations. Of course, we had to complement our business model with a technology platform that allows the host to monitor the premises, but also a EV, EV uh, driver app to manage the charging um, activity and look around for additional charging stations. So with this proactive approach, we engage with different type of uh, venues and we convince them to anticipate the EV adoption um, and, and the value of our proposition at that time. And we convince them despite of a lot of skepticism on the EV adoption trend. So we started in Miami, Florida with a campaign called a float aimed to preserving Florida one connection at a time. And we quickly got traction. Our initial focus on corporate headquarters, multifamily condominiums, and municipal buildings led us to a substantial growth. From our initial deployment of 18 charging points, including those in Carnival Cruise Line uh, corporate headquarters, we rapidly expand to 800 charging points and more than 200 uh, um, clients. Um, uh, and that increments substantially our quarterly revenues. But the uptime in the network and the convenience of the locations for EV drivers led us to a repeat business that not only fuel a strong utilization in the network, but also prove our unit economics and the viability of our model. But most importantly, attracted institutional investors. So that initial success in Florida led us to a national campaign. Now we're operating in 25 states and we have reached agreements with industry leaders, such as SUSI Partners, a infrastructure fund out of Switzerland, Drive, a global comprehensive platform developer, and ChargePoint, a US leader manufacturer. And with that, we became top 10 of charging uh, networks in the US in the live, work, and play uh, space. Now, now we want to transcend the traditional approach of an EV charging network by embracing and venturing into uh, new energy solutions. What we want to do is to transform our EV network into an energy player by not only charging EVs, but also contributing with the grid by allowing vehicle to grid transactions. That would put us on what we call a virtual power plant, where we can definitely contribute with the stability of the grid, um, of the grid by, uh, especially as we embrace that new forms of renewable energy into the marketplace. So we can leverage the energy stored in the EVs and the massive data that we generate. So our team with technology, finance, uh, consultancy and uh, renewable energy background, we have been able to secure up to now $20 million for fueling our growth and our innovation. But now we're in Series A for $15 million to continue our national expansion, execute our 10x, um, 10x growth plan towards 2026, develop our energy vision, and I would love to have more conversations so and explore opportunities with you guys. 
uh, to continue fulfilling our mission. Thank you very much. Luis, that was great. Uh, super exciting. Um, I guess maybe jump to the, the last part of your presentation um, and talking about how sort of essentially turning the, the EV charging into these virtual power plants, where as I understand it, you're putting energy back into the grid. Um, how, what are the regulatory challenges in doing that? Because presumably you need a utility um, in the market that you're working in that wants to participate in that. Talk about the, the hurdles um, required to do it. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, there are three, three hurdles there. One is the vehicle, second is the charger, and, and third is the regulatory uh, regime. In the US, FERC 22 is also work, is already working in defining the way of distributed renewable resources can get into the grid. There is a lot going right now into that. So we expect that within two, two years, the technology, the regulation, and, uh, and, uh, and the willingness to, to, to that to be happen is going to be ready for that. So the rest is to find the right business model that can make it happen in an economic way. In the meantime, we're preparing the network to be ready for that. Awesome. Congrats on your traction so far moving from Miami to 25 states. And can you talk a little bit about your revenue models from the way that it was to transitioning to the VPP model and some financial projections? Yes. Um, so we, we currently uh, have a the revenue model is charging um, uh, idle time uh, uh, advertising. Then we're shifting into um, digital advertising and later on the, um, on the vehicle to grid and, uh, and data monetization type of, uh, of revenue. Uh, so we're expecting to have in, in, in about 10 years, 50,000 uh, charging points and half, half and half of the revenue around 300 and 400 million will be uh, vehicle to grid and the other one will be charging. That's pretty much our, our, our expectations. Now, understanding that the, the uh, OBE that you're evolving, but under the current model, how long does it typically take to begin to ha have a location become profitable? Because if you're sort of paying for everything up front initially, um, and then what is it, a couple of years um, before it becomes profitable? Well, um, it depends on, on the utilization and, mm. and the selection of the, of, um, of, uh, of the place is very, very Gee, important. Right. Yeah. Uh, back in um, um, back two, two three years ago, um, we were kind of sitting in the computer, just begging them someone will pass away, pass and charge in that in that <laughs> location. Right now, utilization is is going really fast from the very beginning, to I would say two or three months. We're seeing going from zero to 20, 25. Our cut rate is anything between fifteen, and if it's fifteen is about three years, but we're seeing bigger numbers right now, so it could shorten uh, with time. If you want to, really, I, I got another one. Go ahead. Uh, to follow up, go ahead. Okay, sure. <laughs> uh, the, um, and in terms of, you talked about how it's really important picking the places, oh, because yeah. obviously you have to identify high traffic places, and multifamily housing, office buildings, things of that nature. How over time has that analysis changed in terms of places that you want to put EV charging stations? Well, I'll give you an example. When we COVID hit, we, we, we start deploying more on the multifamily places. However, we have kind of four or five verticals. There all has to be where people live, work, play, and learn. And as data comes um, every day, we shift into how people are really behaving. And uh, we are expecting that among those four uh, typical um, verticals, um, utilization is going to be good from now on because people need to charge in convenient locations. And as adoption comes up, it seems like it, it's really happening. And, and how are you met yet? 50 seconds, but how are you measuring the impacts from an environmental standpoint? 
Well, yeah, the, the, the substitution of basically uh, driving electric towards driving uh, gas, and then you apply a, a formula of substitution of that, and that's how we count for carbon credits uh, related to, to, uh, to the emissions. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much.